you very much, Daniel. Uh, and also, uh, thank you everyone for joining today. I would like to, along with uh, Laura from uh, uh, TU Delft, to give an introduction as to the work that we've been covering in the Annex 70, which is um, building energy epidemiology. And so I would like to both introduce that concept and then describe one of the activities that we've been working on together as a group around uh, how we can improve the process of reporting around a transition of energy and building stock models. So I, I'll share a presentation now, which I hope that you'll be able to see. So in terms of a, a best reporting and practice guideline, one of the advantages that borrowing from uh, the epidemiology world is that they have a set of of standards and protocols and, and ways in which we can study populations. And, and I'll come to this in a moment, but, but the important thing to take away is we have uh, an incredible challenge uh, ahead of us as Daniel and others have identified, which is we need to shift to a zero carbon efficient and resilient building stock. And a lot of that is of course, where both empirical observations of what things are really happening out in the world and how is it that we're evaluating them in terms of a modeling activity, because these two things are incredibly important and, and things like uh, the performance gap or rebound effect or prebound effect, you know, these are, are problems that we, we deal with when working with a modeled uh, worldview as compared to the real worldview. And unfortunately, we need zero carbon to be a real world uh, phenomena and not just in the modeling world, which is where we, we may exist today. And so to give an illustration of this is when we look at, say, for example, the IEA's um, overview of building performance and where things might change to date, what we've seen across the modeled world and the empirical world when we when we come across and figure out what's going on, uh, demands in, in buildings have increased. You know, this is to do with the activity, to do with the more buildings being built, but it wouldn't have increased quite as much as, as may have been the case because of efficiency. It helps to reduce that peak demand down. And we can look at where that's happening. But when we go forward, uh, we have to make these same assessments, how much of buildings uh, being built will achieve what performance standard and thus how much emissions can we expect and as a result avoid. So why do we wanna change the way we're currently uh, undertaking our research is, well, first off, as I said before, we have to vastly either reduce energy use or improve and improve energy intensity from the building stock, particularly so among developing um, economies. Much of this needs to happen through efficient built environment because it's such a large responsibility of global emissions. And of course, it's going to be worth many trillions of, of currency uh, dollars or whatever. And so the investment um, risk around it going wrong, we have to you know, really avoid. And we're very good at studying a single building. And when we begin to think about groups of buildings, we tend to say, well, they are repeats of a building. And we recognize that not all buildings are the same. Some of them are going to be blue. But the problem comes is when you start to analyze building stocks as a population, that we have to take into account the heterogeneity, the variety that we're going to see in the real world. And so we don't need to start from scratch. We can make use of techniques and methods that are already clearly established. So epidemiology, which is the study of populations, which have a sphere around, for example, the social behavioral, the psychological environments and exposures, and that biomedical, that, that physiological system, and these two intersecting, sorry, these three intersecting areas, you know, help to create the world around what epidemiology studies. So it's data-driven on one hand, it's very focused on that empirical evidence observation. It wants to focus understanding the spread and severity of a condition. I think today's world, if I had given this presentation a year and a half ago, we wouldn't have the same concepts now uh, in regular talk, but I think we do. And really the last point is the most important. This research needs to inform both understanding of our, our past activities, but the prospect for the future. So energy epidemiology is the systematic study of the distributions and patterns of energy use and their causes or influences in populations. Um, and what that looks like in terms of that same diagram, then, then diagram is we have buildings and technologies on one hand, we have people and behavior on another, and we have the environment and broader society around us. And energy epidemiology draws from all of those. And this is the question that guides us today, which is how would the research landscape change if decarbonizing the building stock were treated like a health risk? 
I think, again, it's not an enormous leap for most of us to consider this. Well, it would be interdisciplinary in, in terms of its approach. It would be large scale population studies that look at prevalence and incidence. So that's things with a phenomena that exists today and how frequent are they? And we need to make use of empirical data, observed data. We have to have data collection protocols uh, for analyzing and archiving and sharing information. This is really, really important for us because we have to continuously learn and improve. We have to have protocols for feedbacks of findings. What's not working? What's failing? Why is it failing? Is it the thing that's being delivered or is the way we're delivering it that is failing? We also have to have systematic reviews of evidence. We have to trust what it is both that we're observing and so that we can improve our modeling approaches. And this last part around research translation and engagement, we have to make it so that people understand what it is that we are describing in terms of our transition pathways. And what this diagram really is giving you an overview of before I go into the thing I'll also now mention is that the central paradigm is that we're shifting to a low carbon society, but we have to make use of the tools available to us to help shift a large population of buildings and energy epidemiology provides a framework for that. It is interdisciplinary. It does have methodological diversity. It is both spanning the observational clinical level through to the policy and evaluation level. And so the thing I wanted to just discuss today on one hand is the evidence synthesis side. So this is where, again, having information that we can translate and share with others in a meaningful way is incredibly important. So one of the activities we've spent some time on, which has been uh, led by a group in uh, Switzerland and, and Sweden, is around model reporting guidelines. Why model reporting guidelines? Well, again, if we were to think through ourselves where it is that we're headed in the future, say around building energy use and intensity, we see these types of figures that come from the IEA, for example, and we make projections around what's going to happen in the future. Now that model needs to be described to us so that we understand it. What is and how is it that the assumptions that are built into it are being described? So in order for us to do that, we need to have a protocol, a guide that helps to ensure that we're describing models in a way that I can understand uh, if I haven't developed it, or um, that you as a modeler could sit down and have a guidance around saying, what are the most important things that I need to tell somebody about my model? Because most of the time we spend all of our effort on the results, that line going down in the future, but it's not enough for us to, to believe whether that's a practical line or not. So building stock energy models in terms of uh, being able to chart that pathway forward, we have a, a large heterogeneity of models. There are many models. Many of us sit down and, and make use of, of others or start from scratch and the like. And so what the Annex 70 proposed is to develop a reporting guidelines similar to that which is done in epidemiological studies. And so in doing so, the aim is to provide that structure of information. How do you report? Reporting guidelines that allow for consistency, that help reviewers, and in particular, uh, reviewers of, of policy reports or reviewers of journal papers, know in a consistent fashion how models are being described. And um, the advantage will be that uh, it can improve the overall quality of modeling that's being done because information will be more shared across models. So to give an illustration of how it is that we've designed this guideline, we have a main topic. So for example, an overview of the model, which describes the aim and the scope, the modeling approach being used, the overall system boundary, for example, what's the temporal scale, geographic scale, uh, what sort of economic sectors are being covered and the spatio-temporal resolution. In other words, are we talking about a really fine detailed model that gives you know, down to the, the, the quarter of an hour, or are we talking about large annual or even multi-annual uh, outputs? And so the topics that we've uh, covered in our guidance include uh, model components. So the, describe the building stock, the people and environments. And I should say each one has a set of guiding questions that the responder and those who are, are filling in this guideline um, can answer. Uh, so we wanted people to describe the model components, the stock, the environment, the energy. We want to understand the inputs and outputs. What's the processes by which these things are, are coming together so that you're describing key assumptions, key inputs and outputs. What's the quality assurance that you've undertaken as a part of the model? I think this is something we spend far too little time in investigating. And when we're describing, for example, the efficacy of an intervention, we need to know 
How has it been assessed? What's the uncertainty around it? How sensitive is the model and or the real world that it's trying to represent to this intervention? So we wanna ensure that there's a very strong quality assurance component to the guideline. And finally, an additional information. So really this is the anything else that needs to be uh, described that could be understood about the model um, activity. So what is it that we think that this model reporting guideline can do, which uh, will be uh, submitted um, shortly to a, a journal paper, but will, will be included as a main part of the reporting of the annex, um, is to improve that overall quality of how models are being described and understood by the community. And what we're hoping for is that transparency means that uh, models can be better understood. And so I, I refer briefly here to the Global Reporting Initiative around um, sustainability reporting guidelines. And this is to ensure that when, for example, whether it's the Dutch, the English, the Canadians uh, are describing their modeling that will align to the Paris Agreement, that we can sit, we can evaluate what's being described, how it's being put together, and we can better understand the pieces so that we can learn from each other to improve overall what we're doing. So, so that's a very brief presentation around both the Annex 70 energy epidemiology and an element of it, which is focused on reporting guidelines. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to turn over to my colleague, Laura, um, as well.